Hi, everyone, uh, and thank you so much for the invitation, Natalia, and thank you to the entire organizing team for the amazing work that you have done to make this event happen. Uh, and I would also like to thank Natalia and the wonderful team of volunteers for getting the second edition of the Data Journalism Handbook translated into Portuguese, which is also the occasion that we are celebrating uh, with this panel. So it's a pleasure to be on this panel and share some insights from the second edition of the Data Journalism Handbook. And more specifically, uh, what I would like to do in this, in this time that I have kindly been offered to introduce the book uh, is to offer three challenges for a critical data journalism practice. And I will speak for about 20, 30 minutes and Jonathan will take over for the Q&A. So I will start with a few words about the book. Um, so the book is open access and can be freely downloaded online. The first edition of the book was published in 2012, so that's close to a decade ago. Uh, and in this time, it has become an important reference point in this field and has been translated into more than 12 languages. And what the 2012 edition did uh, was really to capture the enthusiasm associated with the early days of this practice being recognized. And now, close to a decade later, uh, we are at a point where the practice is both more established, more mature, but also more questioned, given that we are in this moment which has been called a post-truth or a post-fact moment. So this is why the subtitle of the second edition published this year is Towards a Critical Data Practice. So why is that? Well, it's because what we wanted to do with this book uh, was to enrich the stories that we tell about data journalism and to account for these practices a little bit differently than the first edition. So what do I mean by that? Um, and let me give an example. Um, if you work in data journalism, you will know Simon Rogers, the former Guardian data journalist, now at the Google News Lab. Uh, so Simon uh, has been and is a central figure in the data journalism space. And he has done seminal work to build recognition for data journalism as a practice, including securing support for this book, for which we are most grateful. And Simon's chapter in this book uh, provides not only his journey in data journalism, but also a very good picture of the development of data journalism in mostly Western English speaking countries over the past decade. So these developments are linked to transparency movements, efforts to open up government data and datafication and to the availability of tools to clean, analyze, and visualize data. And what we wanted to do with this book is to ask, in addition to this picture of data journalism, what else is out there? Um, and I think that this question of what else is out there is very well aligned with the theme of this panel, data journalism in the world and the intentions of its organizers. So what else enters the picture when we listen to a diversity of voices in this space? And that is really what we wanted to do with this book. We wanted to make space for different perspectives and provocations on data journalism. We wanted to see what happens when we broaden the frame to look at the social, cultural, political, and economic context in which data journalism practices are embedded. We wanted to offer a relational perspective on journalism data practices as a kind of a curatorial craft, assembling and working with diversities and infrastructures to generate different ways of knowing, 
narrating, and seeing the world at different scales and temporalities. And that's really what the book cover is also trying to suggest. Um, and we're really grateful to the wonderful artist Sarah T and the museum where this piece was exhibited for the permission to use it uh, for the book cover. So all of this in the book is really done through the voices of the book's authors. Um, and this book is really a collective experiment in accounting for data journalism practices. It spans a wide range of voices and perspectives, both from data journalism researchers and from data journalism practitioners. It has more than 50 chapters from 74 authors, both researchers and practitioners from around the world. And we are really most grateful to the authors for their wonderful contributions. So it's hard to do justice to 50 chapters and 74 authors in such a short amount of time. Um, so for the purposes of this panel, I organized the insights provided by the many authors of this book into three challenges or three principles for a critical data journalism practice. And this is what I'll use the rest of my intervention today to speak about. So what does a critical data journalism practice mean? Um, and I would like to suggest that critical data journalism practice takes into account these three aspects. Making stories both with and about data, finding alignments with marginalized issues and actors, and cultivating reflexive ways of telling. And I will illustrate each of these with arguments and examples provided by the authors of this book. So the first challenge is about making stories both with and about data and infrastructures and their associated power arrangements. To put it more simply, this is about what Emmanuel Didier, in his review of the book, refers to as data journalists as users and critics of data. This point is also about cultivating what could be called feminist data journalism, following Catherine D'Ignazio's chapter in the handbook. So according to D'Ignazio, taking a feminist approach to data journalism would involve a sensibility towards inequalities and biases inscribed in data sets and in algorithms as one works with them. This is also about data journalism that can be viewed as a form of data activism. That is, data journalism that doesn't just work within dominant regimes that turn every aspect of our lives into data. That is data journalism that also interrogates these data regimes and makes space for public involvement and intervention around data infrastructures. As really several really good data journalism projects have done in the past years. One important example of this is that in the data journalism space is the practice that is known as algorithmic accountability reporting. And the book contains an entire section on this topic of uh, algorithmic accountability reporting. So uh, algorithmic accountability reporting is a beat that is emerging in some newsrooms to critically scrutinize algorithms and data infrastructures. And in the words of computational data journalism expert, Nick Diakopoulos, it is a reorientation of the traditional watchdog function of journalism towards algorithmic power, 
A well-known example of this practice is the machine bias series of the US investigative outlet uh, ProPublica. And uh, as many of you know, uh, this series takes as an object of investigation the use of algorithms in various areas of society. For example, in the criminal justice system in the US to expose its racial bias. Um, and the series also covers Facebook's ad targeting system, Amazon's pricing systems, and many other applications of algorithmic systems in society, which are deserving of closer examination. In his chapter for the book, uh, Diakopoulos addresses the question of when an algorithm becomes newsworthy. Um, and what he also does is that he discusses a variety of methods that journalists use to investigate algorithmic power. So that's everything from reverse engineering to auditing techniques and what he calls low tech techniques to critique algorithms based on observing their outputs and their reactions to user actions. The principle of doing investigations both with and about data infrastructures can also be applied to journalists' own infrastructures. And that is what another chapter in the book does. Uh, so in, in another book chapter, the lens of investigation is inverted and directed towards journalism specific data infrastructures and how these may be reconfigured. Journalist and researcher Stefan Kunda uh, takes up what he calls the platformization of cross border investigative journalism. And specifically, he takes up the case of platforms that host data for collaborative investigations. So in his chapter, Kunda argues that while there is ample critique of social media platforms, so we've been hearing that a lot in the last years, investigative journalism platforms and how they are configuring the journalist as a user are also in need of closer scrutiny. Uh, so he proposes that having a very small number of monopolizing platforms in the global investigative journalism space can be understood as data feudalism. And this term of data feudalism uh, draws on the work of internet critic Evgeny Morozov. Uh, so the chapter by Kunda discusses concerns about access control, issues of free labor and governance issues associated with some investigative journalism platforms. Um, and it also warns of how uh, its gig economy model might be conducive of creating a precariat in investigative journalism. So Kunda's orientation as a journalist is towards reconfiguring models and infrastructures for collaboration in cross-border investigative journalism. Uh, so that means that instead of a small number of large investigative journalism platforms, he would like to see a multiplicity of independent networks organized around equitable governing principles and co-ownership models. Yeah, and Stefan is experimenting with setting up one such uh, alternative network. Yeah, so those were just uh, a couple of examples of how this principle of making stories with and about data and reconfiguring infrastructures is explored in the book. Uh, and there are several other chapters that look at this. And if you have any examples from your own work or the work of others, we would love to hear from you. So please do get in touch and my contact details will be on the last slide. Um, and also when it comes to making stories with and about data, there is also much more that data journalists and researchers investigating the data society can learn from each other. So collaborations, not only between journalists, but also between journalists and researchers are essential in investigations about algorithmic power and about unequal 
power distributions in the data society. So moving on, um, the second challenge that the authors of this book raised has to do with aligning projects with issues, actors, and interests marginalized by unequal arrangements in specific contexts. So very simply, this challenge is about asking the question, data journalism by whom? for whom and in whose interests. And in the book, uh, this question is raised by scholar and educator Marilyn Young and journalist and researcher Candace Callison in their chapter, Data Journalism and Whose Interests. Um, and they argue that these are important questions to ask, given that journalism in Western countries often plays a role historically and now, intentionally or not, in maintaining social orders associated with the state, but also patriarchy, settler colonialism, and white supremacy. Taking the example of indigenous peoples, they discuss how data gathering about these groups has always been enmeshed with a project of settler colonialism. And they point to the risks of these archives now informing machinic ways of knowing, including in data journalism. In a different chapter, scholars and activists Tahu Kukutai and Maggie Walter call the data that emerge from statistical surveillance of indigenous populations as 5D data. So that's data that focus on difference, disparity, disadvantage, dysfunction, and deprivation. So these are data detailing indigenous overrepresentation in negative health, education, poverty, and incarceration rates and which have negative implications for indigenous lives. In addition to misrepresentation by means of 5D data, another problem that Kukutai and Walter raise is what they call indigenous data deserts. So the absence of data on indigenous populations. Relatedly, in their chapter, Young and Callison point to how, in the context of media reporting in the United States, indigenous communities there are known as asterisk nations. So this points to how they are frequently represented in charts and graphs with an asterisk due, due to the absence of data on these groups. So, uh, where does this leave data journalists working on projects involving indigenous peoples and issues? In their chapter, Kukutai and Walter discuss one set of practices that could help to mediate some of these risks and provide a starting point for critical data journalism practice involving indigenous peoples and issues. And this is Indigenous Data Sovereignty, or IDSOF, as an emerging site of science and activism. Uh, so there are networks that are concerned with the rights of Indigenous peoples to own, control, and access data derived from them, and which pertains to various aspects of their lives. Uh, so there are several such networks that have been established in various parts of the world, and you can see some of these uh, on the slide. These networks can represent valuable sources of data and expertise for data journalism. And the chapter by Kukutai and Walter also includes recommendations for data journalists working on stories involving indigenous peoples and issues, and who seek to align their projects with the interests of these communities and to make meaningful space for indigenous perspectives in journalistic stories. 
There are several other examples in the book on how data journalism projects could be aligned with issues, actors, and interests marginalized by unequal power structures in specific contexts. So there is this other chapter from data journalist Eva Constantaras on data journalism by, about, and for marginalized communities. When it comes to aligning projects with neglected issues, another chapter looks at citizen data journalism and citizen data activism practices in China. Um, and this is specifically around key issues of concern, such as air pollution. Um, and the chapter discusses example of citizen air pollution sensing fo focused on aspects of air quality, not monitored by official infrastructure. And it also discusses the well-known data storytelling project Under the Dome on the severity of the air quality crisis, which combines charts and graphics with, uh, with voice narration. So these were a few examples of how this question of data journalism by whom, for whom, and in whose interest is explored by the authors of this book and how space can be made for meaningful public participation in data projects. Um, and again, I would like to ex extend the invitation to please get in touch if you have any other examples, as we would love to continue to find ways to, to explore and to feature such projects, because they are very important. Uh, Okay, so moving on to the, to the final challenge. Um, so the final challenge that I will talk about is cultivating uh, what we call reflexive ways of telling. So what does that mean? Uh, it means developing storytelling styles that recognize that knowledge is always situated, provisional, plural, and it always comes with a degree of uncertainty. And for the sake of simplicity, I refer to all of these aspects as reflexive ways of telling. Uh, and I'll try to say a little bit more about what each of these means. Um, so I'll start with a bit of uh, the background that prompted this principle, uh, which is provocatively summarized in one of the book chapters as data journalism as an empirically self-assured profession. Uh, so in his chapter, journalism researcher Chris Anderson describes data journalism in Western countries as an empirically self-assured profession. Uh, and if there are any data journalists in the audience, uh, perhaps you could think about how you relate to this statement. Um, but the chapter author really refers to a number of things uh, with, this, uh, with this statement. Uh, for example, there is generally a confidence amongst data journalism practitioners in Western countries uh, that the field is on the rise and is generally doing well. There is also um, a positivist orientation in the field. So what does positivism mean? It means a belief that facts somehow speak for themselves once they have been properly prepared. And in his chapter, Anderson provides a genealogy of data journalism in the United States as a way to encourage self-reflexivity around this practice and as a way to complement what he describes as the understandable and well-deserved self-confidence of this profession. So two aspects of this principle of encouraging reflexive ways of telling or reflexive ways of storytelling are provisionality and uncertainty. Um, and one of the recommendations that Anderson makes based on his genealogy work is to cultivate processes by means of which data journalism could better convey its own provisionality and uncertainty. And one of the areas that he suggests requires more attention 
is how uncertainty is represented in data journalism projects. Um, and one example of how this could be materialized, we think, is offered by a data journalist in her chapter in the book. So this is the chapter by data journalist Mona Chalabi on sketching with data. Uh, and many of you may already be familiar with Mona Chalabi's work. Uh, so she argues that sketching with data is a way to reconfigure relations between the journalist and the reader. She argues that the medium of sketching with data can make the provisionality, uncertainty, partiality, and limitations of the visual representation more immediately accessible to the reader. This is another example from Chalabi's work, uh, which she, she thinks is rather transparent about its shortcomings, yet it is very effective. Uh, so this example engages with the issue of endangered species by means of sketches that try to fit the remaining numbers of each endangered species into the same space. In this case, it's a New York subway carriage. So reflexive ways of telling or reflexive ways of storytelling also engage with the role of emotions. And here again, Mona Chalabi's work highlights the role of emotion when engaging with data visualization. Yeah, so this is a visualization that compares the size of a solitary confinement cell to that of a parking space in the US and thereby makes it experienceable through the proxy of the parking space to which many of us can relate. Several other chapters engage with this topic of emotions in data projects. Um, and in their chapter, he Helen Kennedy and her co-authors report on the important role that emotions play in people's everyday engagements with news data visualizations, which their research highlights. A similar observation is made by Caitlin Petre, this time about visualizations aimed at journalists themselves. Uh, and in her chapter on how journalists work with audience metrics, she argues that audience analytics dashboards are not really met with this dispassionate rational interpretation that we expect from engagements with data, but they are met with emotional reactions. Uh, so for the journalists in the, in the audience, this may be something that you may have experienced yourselves when working with audience metrics. Um, Petra gives the example of Chartbeat, which of course many of you will know. It's a popular audience analytics dashboard for journalists. Um, and the makers of this service designed it with particular emotional reactions in mind. So they want the service to be used, so they make sure that the design communicates deference to journalistic judgment. It softens the blow when traffic numbers are low, and that it also offers some opportunities for celebration when stories do well. Catherine D'Ignazio, in her chapter, draws attention to, of course, the ethical responsibilities that come with leveraging emotion in data journalistic work. And finally, uh, reflexive ways of telling or reflexive ways of storytelling also cultivate plurality and situatedness. So what does this mean? It means that they value a multiplicity of knowledge forms and consider their situated aspects. So what does the situated aspects mean? So the term comes from the work of feminist researcher Donna Haraway and refers to the obvious but often forgotten fact that all knowledge making, including journalistic knowledge making, is embedded in particular times places and contexts, and that these have implications for the knowledge we produce and for the stories that we tell. 
For example, in her chapter, media researcher Anita Se Chan argues that data journalists should aim to diversify their data sources and decenter methods that would privilege dominant analytical regimes, such as those associated with big data. She argues that data journalists should engage with bottom up data practices. So for example, the citizen sensing discussed earlier would be an example of this, as well as with efforts to resist big data. And of course, many interesting data journalism projects in the past years have done this and have done this really well. And again, I would love to hear any examples that you might have um, on this in the Q&A session. Um, and this is again where alliances might be pursued, not only with computer scientists, but also with researchers in critical data studies, algorithm studies, software and platform studies, digital methods, internet studies, and post-colonial computing. And there are many interesting examples that we could think of here. Uh, but to conclude, uh, I will give just uh, one final example from the book uh, that illustrates how data journalism can engage with diverse forms of media and experiential ways of knowing. So this is an example of participatory visual knowledge making that comes from the work of Chicas Poderosas, and many of you might know of the work of Chicas Poderosas. So this is a transnational network of journalists, designers, and programmers who work on participatory media projects with marginalized communities in South, South America. Uh, and this is an example from one of their workshops, which uses beading as a visualization medium to explore questions of identity in these communities. Uh, Yes, yeah, so those were a few ways in which this final principle of cultiv cultivating reflexive ways of telling can be explored in the context of data journalism. So I will stop here. I hope that I didn't take too much time. Uh, so this was a quick tour of some of the work in the uh, in the book. The book is really rich. It, there is really a lot of material. So I tried to make justice to, to everything that uh, that is in the book. Um, and I hope that it, this will provide some inspiration for ways of thinking about and doing critical data journalism practice. Uh, and again, I'm sure that many of you will already be doing these things in your work. Um, and we would love to hear more about some of your own experiences, some of your own practices and examples around these three challenges. Hopefully, we'll have a bit of time for that um, in the Q&A. Yeah, so please do share them in the Q&A or get in touch with us afterwards. We would really love to hear more about um, any of these themes. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs>